morning and happy Friday, everyone. My name is Jessie Yin. I am the Vice President of the Australian Chamber of Commerce, Singapore. On behalf of the Chamber, I want to thank our guests for joining us this morning. Welcome to our two-part series on Leading the Way in Digital Trade, Lessons for Global Trade from the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement, or DEA in short. Austrian Singapore is delighted to partner with Asia Society Australia, the Australian High Commission, and the Global Trade Professions Professionals Alliance on these two events. The first part of the series was held last evening. Personally, it has been an interesting session listening to the panelists, where whilst it was focused on the policy aspect, there's clear reference from the panelists that policies can't work unless the business, businesses actively participate and provide feedback. A bit of takeaway um, from yesterday's session that I'd like to um, just mention uh, briefly. Even prior to the current COVID situation, there's been efforts in promoting the use of digital in global trade, and this has allowed businesses, especially the smaller enterprises, in building up scale and business capacity. The COVID-19 situation has certainly pushed forth a faster adoption of digital trade, although it is still a long way to go. The three key elements in increasing digitalization sorry, lies in availability of infrastructure, which would include um, things like internet connectivity, availability of payment gateways and logistics. These are elements, thankfully, are already there when one look at promoting the use of digital trade between Australia and Singapore. However, same may not necessarily be there when you one look at the less developed economies, um, you know, including some within the region. Nonetheless, the agreement will set forth the way for future engagement in the rest of the region. Today, we will look at some practical aspects and examine the opportunities and trends and explore how to capitalize on the benefits that the digital economy agreement will bring. Before we hear from our panelists, let me quickly go through today's proceedings. The panel discussion will last for about 40 minutes and you can submit your questions through the YouTube chat box and we'll try to get through all of them. Webcast will end at 9.45 in Singapore time. It is my pleasure now to introduce our speakers. You can find their full biography on our, um, on our website. But briefly, Lisa McCauley will model today's session. She is the executive, executive director of the Global Trade Professionals Alliance. Stephen Miller, who is president and group chief executive of SD Telemedia. Alan Yang, the Regional Manager of Meat and Livestock Australia in South and Southeast Asia, as well as Greg Answorth, the Recent Assurance and Digital Business Leader for PwC Singapore. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse, and um, thank you to, to all the organisations that have invited me to moderate um, yesterday's session and today's. Um, I tend to like to jump straight into the discussion because I know that you're not here to not here to hear from me. You're here to hear from the experts that are all joining us online. Um, just a brief introduction in terms of the topic. One of the things that came up um, unexpectedly yesterday at the end of the session was a discussion around capacity building of businesses around e-commerce and digital trade um, and skills development and the organizations that were online talked about the need to expand the opportunities for business to upskill in this area which is why this session is probably very important to go through some of the areas that businesses should focus on, but also to discuss potentially how organizations can collaborate together to ensure that businesses are prepared for the future around e-commerce and digital trade. So I'm just going to quickly ask each of our panelists to, they, they've been introduced, but I'd like them to say in sort of one sentence, what, what skills and capabilities they're bringing to today's discussion before I start the first question. Greg, to you first. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, and, and good morning, everybody. First of all, um, just a, a little bit of background. So my, well, I've got a couple of key roles at PwC Singapore. One of those is leading our digital business uh, initiatives across the firm. And when we look at that, it's looking at how we help clients navigate some of this complexity we see. Um, obviously, with the uh, trade agreement being agreed, we're looking to eliminate some of that complexity. Um, and when we look at it, we're looking at to see how companies can position themselves for future opportunities, manage some of the risks. And actually, we do have a very big focus on, on 
supporting upskilling for, for different organizations as well. Thank you. And Stephen? Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, good to have this discussion following on yesterday. Um, from uh, SD Telemedia point of view, we have um, <clears throat> have our business focus in three areas. One is traditional telecom services. Uh, we have quite an expansive data, data center business in multiple countries across Asia. Um, and then we have um, uh, what we call Infratech, which is B2B software enabled services. So DEA is right in our sweet spot and we're looking at it for um, to increase the ease of doing business in multiple jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> the elimination of uh, complexity and also mutual rec recognition of standards uh, and requirements that you don't have to replicate um, uh, all your base activities and compliance, conformity, um, <clears throat> uh, risk assurance, etc. So we see this as a you know an important first step you know for potentially a more regional uh, framework that uh, should enhance uh, capabilities. In terms of resources, I think it's well recognized <coughs> across different uh, different verticals that there isn't enough capacity at the moment, you know, particularly in cyber. And so the more that we can align standards, aligned, uh, align interoperability, that would actually take a lot of pressure off um, uh, securing enough resources in order that we can enhance this capability. Hi, Ellen, and, and you bringing your industry experience to the table from a very practical perspective. Yes, exactly. Um, I've lived in Singapore for about six years now. Um, previous to Meat and Livestock Australia, I worked for Treasury Wine Estates. So um, I've got a bit of experience in the wine industry and some of the challenges we faced um, and now in the meat industry. So just bringing some really practical examples of how this DEA will really help business across the region. Fantastic. Um, so we've got some great experience uh, on, on this panel today. So I'm going to start open to the first question. Greg, this will go to you first and then to Stephen. What are the opportunities for Australian and Singapore businesses in the digital area now? Yeah, I think there are a number of opportunities. I mean, some of which are being explored regardless of the DA agreement. But my, my sense is this helps move things forward. I think it's important to realise this is not an endpoint in itself. It facilitates uh, a lot of discussion around new opportunity areas. Um, a lot of those are encapsulated in the MOUs that have been agreed to look at specific areas for innovation and development. But if I look at the real here and now benefits and, and opportunities, there's a few focus areas that I see. One is, I think, just the ability to, um, ex at a government level, exchange more information, insights, enables the respective governance to be able to support different industry sectors in a more proactive way to drive more trade uh, that's facilitated through digital mechanisms and and also to um, to simplify that process. So I think just even the the governmental cooperation is uh, is enables a huge opportunity for growth. I think the other two key areas is we obviously have a lot of. Um, physical trade going on between the two countries um, and we want to see that expand and grow. I think the ability to support the simplification of that um, through digital platforms, uh, mechanism, sharing of data enables growth and once again the meat industry could be one, you know, there's various other industry sectors that I, I suspect are well positioned to benefit. And probably the third one is around the, the digital economy from the perspective of um, not the non-physical side of things. So this is the development of content sharing, data sharing, data enabled platforms, um, things such as cloud computing, all of these areas that are going to be supported by simpler and consistent standards are, are very well poised to benefit. Thank you. And Stephen, from your perspective, the opportunities in this area? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that's important in the agreement that doesn't get a lot of attention is um, what it actually specifically doesn't uh, allow. So in the sense that, um, you know, if you take source code, you're not required to provide source code. Um, if you think about uh, cross-border data transfer, you're not uh, required necessarily to localize your data on the, on the data transfer. So I think as much as 
um, <clears throat> enhancing in a positive way is important and Greg gave a good summary. I think it, the clarity around what's not allowed is equally important um, in that, you know, if you're a bank, if you're an airline, if you're trying to develop a new payments platform, then it, the clarity around uh, some of these areas is uh, very important. Um, I think there is an uh, uh, initial indication around cybersecurity. Uh, I think that's an area that's a good start, but I think that one is actually going to be very critical um, in, in terms of mutual recognition of what's required on cybersecurity in order to enhance the confidence levels of developing uh, the DEA uh, cooperation areas. Great, thank you. And Ellen, you come at this as a, from a different perspective because obviously you're, 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 you're talking about physical food. Yes, yeah, exactly. From and your industry perspective, what does it mean? It means a little bit of a different thing. It does. And I think what's exciting is we're going to see um, some really immediate um, opportunities and it, it's as simple as no more paperwork. So, um, you know, a lot of the exporters and farmers that send meat to Singapore at the moment have to do copious amounts of paperwork to get that product over here. And once it's done, it then has to go through processes where that paperwork's submitted and it's a, um, a health certificate for that product. And if that's digital, there's going to be so much more um, opportunity to have speed to market, um, you know, less human error. Uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of stock not being rejected because um, the paperwork was wrong and being sent all the way back to Australia or product just being completely destroyed. So we're really excited to just see some of the immediate benefits and, and with digitalisation, you know, there's great opportunity as well to be able to just look at the process of how we are sending product um, into market, but then how do we potentially re-export that product as well? Um, because as soon as one box of meat gets opened with that health certificate, you're not allowed to then resend it anywhere else. So potentially, if this is digital, then we can send it from Singapore then to um, the rest of Southern Asia and use Singapore as a bit of a redistribution hub. Incredible. I mean, we all well know that the, there's some in some cases in shipments, you're, you're talking thousands of, pe of pieces of paper in a container. Um, uh, and the, the delays that that means at the border for compliance and actually the physical costs, even just for compliance of paperwork is, 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 is staggering. So you get yeah. savings and efficiency as well. Yeah, and I mean, even manpower and um, the amount of time that you don't have to spend doing that, um, you know, yeah. staff costs, everything. Yeah, it all, it all adds up. <laughs> um, so um, following on from that, we talked about the opportunities, but also alongside it, there are going to be challenges for Australian and Singapore businesses as they navigate this new digital space. So following just the same order, if that's okay, Greg, what, what do you think the biggest challenges are? Yeah, I, I think the challenges um, don't all get corrected through one agreement. I think that's an important point to note. Um, but I think these are obviously good steps in that direction and facilitate uh, further work to be done. If I look at the, um, I suppose some of the challenges I see is one of the, the I suppose the confidence part of this. Um, Stephen talked a lot already about cybersecurity. I think where technology and uh, digital platforms are not trusted from a security point of view, a data protection point of view, I think that slows down progress. I think building in the right um, confidence levels is really important. So confidence is, is key. I think the other one is convenience. And once again, the, Ellen had a very good example there where the, uh, the process of transacting can be made a lot more convenient through digital platforms. And then I think probably the third part is um, j just around the commerciality as well. I think this is going to allow new opportunities for cost savings for existing organisations just to process trade. But I do think it should stimulate more innovation. So overcoming that challenge of good ideas that people want to put into market, but it's difficult to do because you don't have common standards. We don't have people skilled up. We don't have the regulations to support innovation and things such as data sharing, which is going to be so important for new business models. There's some of the challenges I think that this will help with and it'll be continued work in progress, I suspect. Thanks, Stephen, from your perspective. Yeah, I think there was, uh, you know, a good amount of discussion yesterday on standards and standards development, standards recognition. So I won't sort of repeat that, but, you know, I, th I think, um, you know, um, uh, a very complex area in this is actually not the right shiny box, but there's, you know, there was a statement in the AI NOU 
which you know is really making it a human-centered approach and really think about the individual impact of a lot of the technology so it's not um, actually in a lot of these areas te the technology is not the limiting factor it's basically that these agreements these standards have got to catch up with the technology um, and things like you know when I say difficulty if you look at the PDPA MOU it's the longest MOU amongst all of them and it's got a lot more provisions and definitions than um, if you look at data innovation or something like that but that, that's necessary because it's amazingly complex but you know that there's the prize right if we can get you know if we get harmonization around PDPA so that uh, and the equivalence that that means if you're certified and um, compliant in one jurisdiction you have confidence uh, that you are equally recognized in, in, in the reciprocal um, uh, jurisdiction. I think digital identity is another one um, where both sides are moving forwards on that. Both, both countries have got programs on that. And I think if, again, if we can get that right between uh, on a bilateral basis, um, and I think Bruce pointed out yesterday is this is not limit, this per se is not limited to just Singapore and Australia. If we can add in other countries uh, into the same framework, then you get the multiplier effect. And I think that's, it's challenging to get things, those things right, because it's governance and ethics, not technology. But the, the prize from doing so, I think is tremendous. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ellen, what I'm going to do is ask you to sort of maybe raise any challenges that your industry specifically has. Um, but then following on from that, if you can elaborate on a practical example of how, how, the, how overcome, this will help overcome those challenges for you. Yeah, I sort of when you say the word challenges, I think that the opportunities far outweigh the challenges. Um, just from a really simple and practical perspective for um, the immediate sort of opportunity that we have, which is just sending products without paperwork. Um, so I think that uh, Greg touched on it a little bit. It's about making sure that we've got all of our systems in place. So when the green light goes, we can actually get become digital straight away. So we need to make sure that we've invested in the right digital platforms and worked um, to get the industry ready for when we can go digital. Um, uh, that's sort of where we need to get our backyard right. Um, and then once we've got that, you know, it's it's very simple. We can just send product with um, an electronic um, digital signature and all of those sorts of things. So I, I don't see huge challenges. Um, you know, Stephen did touch on cross-border um, trade. You know, that, that could be a few challenges there um, with all of the different uh, regulations around um, accepting product. Um, so, you know, standardisation across the region would be a bit of a challenge, um, but, but at the moment we're just looking at all the positives. We need positivity this year, so... Absolutely. <laughs> ...fashion focused on the positivity and going into 2021. Um, Greg, with the clients you've worked with at PwC and the work you do, any, any kind of sort of case studies examples you can um, bring to the table? Yeah, I think one thing which has um, really come to the fore, particularly in this environment with the, uh, the pandemic and, and the major shifts we've seen in remote working and the, the challenges of organisations having to go digital in many ways as uh, just to survive in, in the initial stages. Uh, I think one of the big challenges we see is for the smaller organisations. So if we look at it, the larger organisations, as Ellen said, have often already invested in the right digital technologies. Um, in, in many cases, the capabilities. There's still obviously a lot more upskilling to do for all organisations and the, um, the, the the economy as a whole and the population as a whole. But the SME sector we're finding is, is, is really challenged by the current environment, both from an economic point of view and also for those who are not well placed and haven't gone digital already you know, making those steps to go digital without having the resources, without having, from a financial point of view, but also skills and access to technology is one of the real challenges. So I think one one example that I see, in fact, uh, PwC has been heavily involved in, is uh, working with, on the Singapore side of things, with the, the MAS, um, other organisations such as IMDA is developing the, um, the Business Sands border, plat, plat Borders platform. And what that aims to do is provide a platform that enables SMEs operating throughout the region to access procurement systems of larger organisations, uh, facilitate easier trades, better information sharing, 
and enable that um, that trade to be to be done where where many of these organisations would really struggle to go cross border otherwise. So I think that's one that one, we're still very quite early into developing and um, fully, uh, I, I suppose, making that uh, optimised in terms of that platform at the moment. But it's moving along with a fair amount of momentum, and I think that's an example where that platform together with the facilitation of the DEA agreement and other steps being taken from a government and regulatory point of view should really facilitate and support SMEs to go regional and uh, and help to build their business and, and drive a lot more efficiency around different industry sectors. Thanks and I think that that was something that came out very clearly yesterday and again to re-emphasize that it's SMEs that really are the backbone of most economies and they're the, most, they're the sector that's been most hit by the crisis. And so anything that we can do to help support their economic recovery going forward, using e-commerce or using digital services as a way to expand their product offering or service offering is going to be really important. <coughs> Stephen, I don't know if you have any practical examples you want to add. Yeah, I don't want to be a naysayer on the SME side, but I think, you know, you know from our telco perspective, we serve or we try to address SMEs um, and they are phenomenally hard to to encourage to digitalize, um, you know, and particularly in this environment, changing your invoicing platform, getting hooked up, whatever else is not necessarily their current priority. You know, their current priority is just to survive and whatever else. So I think I fully agree that the SME sector is something that you know will benefit tremendously, but I think we've got to also accept that you know it's got to be at, at a pace and in a context that they're willing to to deal with, um, because you know often that will say is like yeah next year <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. So I, I think we've got to you know uh, identify, but I think moderate our expectations about how how quickly that's going to transform. Um, maybe if I take the other end of town, uh, sort of the top end of town, I think the um, you know, there's a saying is, you know, uh, corporates, um, you know, five year digital journeys just became a two year digital journey. And I think that, you know, th we're going to see that accelerate um, uh, across the board. So digital transformation is a pretty wide sort of buzzword, not only in enterprises, but in governments as well. Um, and I think the importance of something like DEA um, is critical because when you're trying to architect or design what your new digital platform going, going to look like, what your businesses processes are going to look like, uh, what um, interfaces you need. The more we can get uh, compatibility around um, D, you know, DEA standards makes that job much easier. So you don't have to um, you know, be prepared for 10 blockchain standards, maybe we can identify two. We don't need you know, six uh, payment platforms, we can focus on one. So I think having the you know something along the DEA process makes the the design the architecture and design of digital transformation processes much more simple and much more um, I think it gives uh, enterprises much more enthusiasm to adopt because they actually know or have a much better idea what the end game is looking like when they when they're planning this out. Thanks. And look, I could could agree with you more on SMEs and um, the, the struggle to help them along this process. I think a lot yeah. of people think that they will just suddenly, you know, a lot of businesses, it's e-commerce is just the same as anything else. Well, actually, it's a totally different strategy and plan that you need to maybe put in place for e-commerce versus, you know, other things. And I guess that's where government might have to have an interventory role in terms of the type of support they can provide to that sect, that the, the SME sector, to help them along with this process. But you touched on, on, on data standards and sharing, and that was where I was going next on what are the key components to, to success in this area. So Greg or Stephen, who wants to just pull that apart a bit further? Yeah, Lisa, maybe happy to start with um, a few comments. I'm sure Stephen would uh, will add on to that. Um, but, I, but I think from a, a data sharing point of view, I, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this area because I, I kind of feel there's this um, a little bit of tension we see around the the whole issue of trying to maintain privacy of data, especially personal data. There's obviously regulations developed, um, for example, in Singapore and Australia uh, to address some of those concerns. But my sense is. Um, if we can find a way to get confidence to 
to be able to facilitate more data sharing. Uh, we see the efforts to do that at a governmental level already developing quite extensively. But I think if we can really develop that at a broader business level to a greater extent, uh, that's going to facilitate a lot more uh, benefits in terms of new business models, new services, and for the benefit of populations as well. Even if you look at something such as um, that's very topical at the moment, such as healthcare, if we can develop ways to enable confidence around more anonymized data sharing amongst relevant organizations, governments, and, and citizens, um, you know, the ability to address uh, health challenges um, will increase quite dramatically. So, so how do you how do you do that? I mean, part of it is around the uh, regulation that provides uh, confidence. Partly, it's also education around uh, how data can and can't be used. Uh, I also think you know there's a lot to be said for developing uh, regulatory sandboxes that allows innovation within uh, using data sharing in a more extensive way, uh, in a managed, controlled way with a, a population set that. Um, that, that you can you can enable a greater level of risk taking in the short term. So it's a big topic, uh, but I think it's a really important one for more progress to be made on, I will call it safe data sharing to enable business and community benefits. Thanks, Stephen. Do you have any comments following on from that? Yeah, I, I think the, um, you know, this is a really tough area, uh, particularly if you're a regulator, um, you know, you're really being asked to balance. If you think about IMDA, <laughs> I think the IMDA just added about 100 people because of the DEA. <laughs> they seem to be responsible for a lot of this. But if you think about what a regulator is trying to do, they're trying to promote innovation around data usage and, and you know, very similar to what we've got here. Very much uh, also being held responsible for privacy standards um, and uh, protection. And we've just seen uh, Singapore uh, enhance and beef up its PDPA requirements. Um, also, you know, it cannot be an inhibitor on trade. Data localization is, is being promoted by some uh, countries would mean their external trade would stop if you, if you read it um, properly. And then there's the cyber standards that we talked about before. Now, if those are the objectives that regulators are being asked to address, some of those are not mutually compatible. So the question is, where's the balance and where's that capability um, uh, is going to land out. So if I look at, say, Singapore, the PDPA Act revisions, I think, make a good balance between um, allowing more um, uh, uh, unauthorized, but not unauthorized, is um, not expressly consented use by corporations of the internal data of their customers. But at the same time, they've increased the um, penalties um, if you are either breached or you um, inadvertently use that data for not, not sanctioned purposes. So I think, um, again, if, um, uh, and you know, Australia's got a similar process. Again, and, you know, the, 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 more, there's, the more that there is clarity around those sorts of elements, the easier it is for everybody to understand and it's easier for then everybody to comply. So I think, um, you know, if you look at the, you know, the other areas, you know, the, the March report on the, Australia Singapore digital trade standards, I think identify the um, supply chain involved and really distinguish between digital goods, uh, physical goods, enablers, and the role that those play in that supply chain. Um, I think augurs well for you know getting clarity and certainty as we go forward on some of this. Thank you. Ellen, I'm going to turn to you now to look at the question of how can physical trade be driven or enabled by digital platforms? Um, yeah, so I think just obvious examples are when we can send stock um, meat to Singapore and it's all done through a digital platform, which is like a health certificate or, um, or even cash payments done um, electronically rather than, um, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And then what we can do is look at how do we um, re-export that product uh, to other regions if, um, if we can, and then, you know, or how do we create um, value adding products as well once we've had uh, it come into the region uh, so quickly and easily. So I think it's all about that speed to market and opportunities to on sell um, and, you know, just without stock being rejected or um, any, you know, of those sort of challenges 
challenges that we're currently facing. Um, a bit of an example is just say a hotel chain like Accor or the Hilton. Um, they have, uh, you know, hotels all over Southern Asia and they might want to do one purchasing model um, rather than lots of different purchasing. Um, and they might have one exporter from Australia um, that they're getting their meat from. And a sustainable way to purchase meat is to actually buy it in bulk rather than you know, um, packet packs and things like that. So if you buy a full carcass, um, as a hotel would, they'd bring it into Singapore um, through a digital health certificate. They could then break down that carcass and then rework it and send it on to all of their hotel chains across the region. That's, that's you know, blue skies. That's where we want to see the model go. Um, but yeah, that's, I think digitalisation will help that and it will just make business and sending product so much easier, but also be more sustainable. Can I follow up then on that with Ellen then, from your perspective, you must have been quite excited as an industry around the signing of RCEP then, because if you're looking at a regional strategy here, the combination of the this agreement and then the plus side of looking at RCEP and TPP for, for you guys must be exciting. Yeah, exactly, because it goes beyond just FTAs. It looks at how do we standardise things and make it more consistent across the region? Um, you know, I find it uh, quite difficult understanding all of the different standards in each region, and I don't know how our exporters must feel when they need to send stock to Thailand or to um, Vietnam and even Malaysia. It's all very different. Um, and so if we start to have more of this regional approach in ASEAN, um, it can only help our um, industry uh, be able to sell their product um, more easily, but also all the businesses in Southern Asia will know how to purchase um, product and, and build better relationships with their exporters and the brands that they want um, to represent in the region. Yeah, is, uh, again, you're saying looking towards positivities. This week has not been too bad with the with the announcement of RCEP as well as we look to forming such a regional trading uh, agreement. Um, Greg, Stephen, do you have... Sorry, Lisa, you've just gone on mute. Sorry. Yeah, Lisa, I didn't hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Commune, you can't, lip, you can't read my lips. Um, I, I, <laughs> do you have any comments too on the physical side of trade through digital? I, I don't probably specifically had a lot to add because I thought the examples used by Ellen were quite demonstrative. I think you know, it gives a really good, some really good practical examples. I do think it once again just comes down to having confidence in the platforms, having the the knowledge and ability to use those and the convenience of um, using platforms. I think all of this in terms of the provisions within the DEA and the, the MOUs all will have a positive effect in terms of enabling um, the ease of more physical trade through digital platforms. Great. And Stephen, do you have anything to, to add to that? I, I you know, uh, defer to Ellen in, you know, in this area. So I, I think the, the other observation I would make as we move down this process is, um, you know, the, the question of enforcement and enforcement, whether that's physical goods or, um, uh, or digital goods. So, you know, if you're, if there's, uh, if there's a breach, you know, which entity can then um, uh, enforce the uh, action against you know whoever's done the breach and will that be you know recognized cross-border so you know for example if you know bank a transfers data to the other jurisdiction and there is a breach in the other jurisdiction then defining who, which government entity has you know has the the, the primary focus around um, uh, investigating and then potentially enforcing that area so i think as we go through these next stage MOUs on, you know, data and innovation, PDPA and whatever else, I think the question of enforcement and um, um, and uh, remedies is is something that's going to have to be picked up. And I think that applies whether it's a digital good or a physical good or a service. Well, you raise a, uh, an interesting point too in terms of the role of customs here as well in terms of. Yeah and customs acceptance of digital documentation. Um, uh, I sat on uh, the WCO e-commerce committee for a couple of years where they were, where we were discussing whether we still needed 133 data points on an e-commerce parcel. Um, 
which does not make any sense. But, you know, Ellen, that is, you know, customs enforcement here when you're looking at moving things sort of in a digital way is a big factor for your sector. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've heard some horror stories about products just um, not being cleared through customs because of a just a human error on a, um, you know, filling in a wrong barcode or something like that. And, um, you know, it's such a waste. And um, for us, that's completely against everything we believe in at, um, in our Australian, you know, meat industry. It's all about sustainability and sharing our product. And, um, you know, it's heartbreaking to hear these stories of product being um, destroyed or being rejected. So that leads, I mean, we, we discussed this a bit yesterday. Someone brought up the need for a T trade facilitation agreement plus that goes a little bit further towards nudging um, authorities to accept digital documentation from a trade facilitation perspective. And yeah, I here too. yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, it, it doesn't take that much to just have an um, electronic version of what we're currently using um, with e-signatures uh, where you can just also track where the stock is along the, the way. So that really helps with traceability as well um, if that form is digital. Um, and you can see where it is in the, the chain of who needs to sign it and where your, uh, if it's been accepted yet or not. Um, so it gives our exporters a lot more um, visibility of where their product is and if it's been gone into the customer yet or not, or if it's still sitting um, you know, in customs and what do they need to do to ensure that it gets through. Well, that raises, I'm a little off intelligent, but I would, the next question was about the role of cross-border like, tr and trade facilitation a bit. Um, but um, it raises the point on this issue of actually digital trade and its role in looking at supply chain security and enforceability, particularly actually in the wake of the pandemic, because we have seen a, certain countries take advantage of PPE. Um, you know, so I don't know if you, if Greg or Stephen, want to comment on the fact that actually the, the, the role of adopting digital technology in supply chains actually is going to be quite important going forward for a number of reasons. I, I, think, I yeah. think that's de definitely correct. And I think what, you know, um, what a lot of people using diverse supply chains have worked out is you can be overly reliant on that supply chain. And that if you have a single point of supply and it's not available to you, um, you know, th th then what? And so I, I think the um, I, I think the other element that um, unfortunately takes up a lot of people's time, if you're also using supply chains, is you know you need to make sure that you are compliant with your internal policies, but also external policies, so that the more that you can digitalize that process, the more that you can get e-certification that your supplier and country Y is um, maintaining, upholding, you know, ethical uh, labor laws, uh, OHS type capabilities. And the more that you can do that digitally, you know, it gives you um, reassurance that, you know, your supply chain is robust, uh, is verifiable. Um, and then, you know, you, again, you need that sort of capability if you're going to use multiple supply chains. Uh, from a d diversification point of view. So the more you can do that sort of capability digitally rather than physically, obviously makes a big difference to your, 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 your compliance and um, maintaining your internal standards. Absolutely. Greg, do you, you, I think you had something to say on this too. Yeah, actually, I'll just build on that um, and maybe kind of looking at it from a broader point of view as well. So I, I think the points that Stephen made there about having a resilient hopefully digitally enabled supply chain and, and options and flexibility there is going to be so important for once again, confidence in the systems and the ability to uh, successfully trade uh, cross border. Um, and it's going to be so important. I, I guess the point I just wanted to make was, um, you know, the discussion at the moment, we're very focused on the Singapore, Australia trade. We're also talked a little bit about the regional perspective with the agreement signed this week as well. Um, I think one interesting dynamic is what do global supply chains look like in future as well. We have obviously China has come into the uh, ASEP agreement. We um, and then we've got the complexity of the the China versus US uh, tensions that we see, and that obviously the the current political dynamics being played out in the US. So I think one question organisations will need to look at is to what extent do they need to um, pivot in terms of their focus on who they're doing trade with and who that trade is supported with through different supply chains. Uh, and it will be interesting to see um, 
you know, where the US moves over the next two to three years when we think about it from a more global point of view around supply chains and trade as well. Yeah, very good point. Um, I'm actually doing a project with this at the moment. Um, um, and I'll share some of the survey results that we've been doing with DFAT on it soon. Um, so just from a timing perspective, a um, bit off topic, um, but to the businesses that are online, could each of you give one big tip that you think should be their key takeaway from your perspective today on this topic? One or two top 10 tips for them. I'll do the same order that I've been doing. It's easier, Greg. Okay, what, what about, yeah, I'll jump in first. The, um, it's always good to go first so you have more options. But um, I, I think the, you know, it's probably the first thing that was raised during the conversation today. And that was around the importance of upskilling. So I think one of the most important things to do is make sure that um, your organization and the key people know what the options are available and are skilled to put in place and take advantage of some of the, the technology platforms, the options, and also understand the regulations to make sure that they optimize um, the opportunities for the business, but also manage the risks and, and stay on the right side of the regulations as well. So it's education and upskilling. Great, Stephen? Yeah, I, um, it, it, it's not particularly insightful, but you know, I think the you know that one of the themes from yesterday that came out at the end was be involved, <laughs> because you know one of the things that's you know quite impressive, uh, you know, out of you know both the agreement but also the MEU is the amount of different government departments that are involved on both sides of the equation. So, out of Australia, you've got the Digital Transformation Agency, Industry Science Energy Resources, Home Affairs, ATO. Agri agricultural water, um, the Australian Information Commissioner out of Singapore, IMDA, Smart Nation, Digital Government, Sing Customs, the Food Agency, the PDPA Commissioner. So I, th I think what businesses have got to understand is government is really going all in on this. Um, and if you look at the scope of the MOUs, the scope of the MOUs is very ambitious. So, you know, standards will be set, you know, um, precedent will be determined. And so I think enterprises, uh, government, government agencies, medium sized businesses really need to be involved because, it, you know, it would be <clears throat> it would be a waste to give up this opportunity to help shape those requirements um, and not being involved and then complaining about the standards that emerge is uh, is. Um, is a wasted uh, position. So I think, um, you know, uh, enterprises got to understand that this is a really good opportunity and the involvement and the participation from companies is critical. Um, and on, on some of these very contentious areas, cyber, PDPA, um, digital standards, digital identity, they're not necessarily easy subjects, but they're important for everybody to contribute to. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. Um, Ellen, any, anything from your side? Um, from my side, I'd probably look at how I would influence um, the Australian sort of meat industry around um, sort of alerting them that Southern Asia is where it's at. You know, it's um, an exciting opportunity now that all of these um, great uh, agreements are happening with the DEA and, um, you know, the signing and the RCEP, it's, it's really an exciting opportunity for our industry to look at Southern Asia, look at the, um, the consumers and how much they're really seeking Australian product at the moment. And, um, you know, maybe taking some of your focus away from other regions that we're struggling to trade with at the moment and potentially really, you know, put more emphasis into Southern Asia and look at the, the opportunities that are here. Well, uh, in my previous role, I always told exporters to not always put their eggs in one basket and to have uh, uh, make sure that they have diverse export markets. Because if one market goes down and it's out of your control, you it takes a long time to build up relationships in new markets, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, so on that, I got a question that that people are interested in is, um, and then what? Well, I, I'm conscious of the timing, but could each of you? Um, someone wants to know how do how do your organisations? How do you help them? How do you work with businesses just so that they know where they can go to for advice or support? Ellen, do you want to go first? Or reverse this time. Yeah, not a problem. So. Um, a bit about uh, Meat and Livestock Australia. We're obviously an industry body. Um, we're funded by levy payers. Um, so uh, we're government audited, but we're um, supported by uh, people who are 
selling um, and exporting beef. So for us, we uh, really look at market access um, in, in the region and we help all of our industry by um, alleviating any NTBs um, and things like that, working closely with the government around FTAs. Uh, we also provide our industry with insights. So I do a lot of work with consumer insights in the region around what uh, Southern Asian consumers are preferring to, to eat and, um, and how do we sort of look at the product that we're currently sending and how to localise it. Um, and how to make it relevant for um, the Southern Asia consumer. And then finally, we help um, our industry by brand Australia. So how do we, you know, creating that um, true Aussie beef and lamb and um, really sort of doing a lot of promotions, PR events um, and that type of thing, social digital uh, sort of promotions and executions. Thank you. Stephen? Um, I, I guess we're, uh, you know, ST Telemedia, we, we sort of are the corporation that's you know directly involved in this. And um, I, th I think the maybe if I can um, take a slightly different tact on this question, I think the other one that um, you know will be interesting as part of this is how does these sorts of agreements then link with you know foreign investment review board? And so you know um, there are some challenges at the moment um, uh, again on sort of. Um, recognition of, uh, you know, MFN type uh, status uh, between. And so some areas for investment, I think, are going to change um, uh, quite substantially. So, for example, you know, if you think about um, the move to the cloud um, and things like that, um, you know, for, from our, our capability set point of view, if we have, um, we don't actually need a physical office now in other jurisdictions, we can do most of that cloud transformation work from Singapore. So we, we've had projects in um, fairly substantial projects in different countries. And I think that, you know, unless, uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, unless the firm type regulations, the foreign investment, foreign investment type regulations also keep up with DEA requirements, that's also going to lag in this process. So I, um, we have to be very careful about, you know, when we think about investing in different uh, in different countries, again with a lot of these compliance and other areas, and I would like that to be a little bit more recognised and a little easier to to navigate uh, as well. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so obviously PwC. I think a lot of the uh, participants would be reasonably familiar with PwC, but. I think I'd, I'd stress, you know, we're a very broad-based professional services firm. A, a lot of us, th a lot of people think of us as an audit and tax firm, which we are, we do that. But uh, I think what we've done a lot over the last two or three years in particular is, is invest very significantly in our capabilities around uh, the digital agenda and helping our clients. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important to note that we've, we've gone through our own uh, transformation quite fundamentally. We've got 3,500 professionals here in PwC Singapore every single one of them has been through a digital upskilling program and we're continuing to invest a lot in that and partly our aim is to change the way that we operate as a firm and, and, and make all the right changes to for the future but also we want to take that learning and, and help companies um, and how do we help companies we want to help them be they, we want to help them grow we want to help them be successful and really importantly we want to help them manage their various risks that they face um, particularly in this digital environment as well. So I guess the invitation would be if there's um, it, you know, any uh, any thoughts in terms of your business, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we're, we're always happy to see how we can help. Well, you guys have come up with Game of Trade, which I think is a really, really cool educational tool on free trade agreements. <laughs> so uh, I have to say, yeah, I think- thank you. Very, yeah, we like that one. <laughs> I do. But then I'm a, I'm a trade geek, so, you know, I definitely like it. Um, I, I, I'm going to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to all of you today for sharing your expertise. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. Again, I apologise, we've gone slightly over. It's really hard to, to cover so much in such a short time. So thank you so much for, for your participation um, as uh, expert panel members. And um, thank you, everyone, for staying online. And I'm going to now hand it over to Jesse to do the final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to the panelists and also mod the moderator for this very interesting discussion. Um, if I could summarize, e-commerce and digital trade is here, definitely here to stay. 
The DA has set the framework for common standards to reduce barriers and build an environment in which Australian and Singapore businesses and consumers are able to participate and benefit from digital trade. The framework would help to facilitate businesses, especially the smaller business, which otherwise may have difficulties in building scale or face challenges in going cross-border. Other benefits that our panelists have uh, talked about, including reducing human errors and hence impacting speed to market. We also talk a, a bit on, about facilitating um, supply chain, which is evolving in this current world, whether it's because of uh, COVID or the, the geopolitics, right? And, and that's where digital trade would actually come in and help um, a lot on that. Our panel, panelists have also pointed out a few more aspects to focus on, including data protection, uh, role of customs in facilitating uh, digital trade. But there's also the mention of, and also learning from yesterday's session, the number of government agencies that has been involved, right, in getting the DA signed. And, and this shows that there's a lot of commitment and interest in getting this right. So to, to, to the words of uh, you know, my conclusion from what the panelists have said is really to make sure that we know uh, and be educated in what the framework brings about and also be involved and be engaged with the agency.